Play. Okay, my friends. Thank you so much again here. And one more time, uh, for me, it's a great pleasure to share uh, my experience and a little bit of our knowledge with colleagues because um, I, I grew up a lot and I learned a lot from my mentors. And for me, it's such a great pleasure to do the same thing that uh, someday somebody did for me. So good evening, everybody. Good afternoon for some people and good morning for other people. We have more than 120 countries participating in our journey and such a pleasure to be here and so grateful I am uh, to be here with you. Okay, so thank you so much again. And today we're going to talk about something very um, important okay, which is complications, okay? Uh, I, I made a joke with my fellows today that if I would tell all my complications here, I would spend the whole night. <laughs> Just kidding. But uh, we all have complications. Everybody who, who perform uh, rhinoplasties or any kind of surgery, of course, you have complications. And the most important thing is to have low rate of complications. And also, if you have, you have to know how to treat it. So what I separated here, and I'm going to share my screen here with you today, is something very nice. Just a second here. I'm going to share. Just, um, yeah, so now I'm going to share my screen and show you some things. Okay, so let's go. So we are here at Preface Academy, and as I said, I want to share uh, a little bit of our experience uh, with some complications, okay? Because everybody, especially for you that is already comfortable uh, with some structural rhinoplasty techniques, and now you're trying to uh, leave your comfort zone and, and trying to incorporate some new concepts of dorsal preservation and do hybrid rhinoplasty or use any kind of other uh, technology involved in our surgery, uh, we are always afraid of complications. And why that? Because uh, some most of you, I'm sure, you already are uh, specialists and you already know how to perform rhinoplasties and of course you evolved during the last years and you have good results as everybody but whenever you change a little bit your way to do the surgery or some techniques on the beginning maybe you can face some uh, results that are not exactly the average that you're used to have so that's what makes people afraid. But on the same time, instead of learning everything from zero or going uh, only for a book as a source of studying and study everything, uh, we are here to uh, use a shortcut for you. And, and I hope that all this information can help you to uh, save your time while you are evolving in rhinoplasty. So our mistakes, are valuable. Valuable for what? Valuable for growth. Every time we have a little mistake or a big complication, we grow a lot. Okay, we grow probably much more than when you only have good results. If I would tell you about uh, different kind of complications, of course, here I didn't list all the complications, but you can find among dorsal complications, irregularities, deviations, hump recurrence, maybe those are the most frequent complications in my cases. 
when I'm saying that, I'm talking about uh, dorsal preservation, okay? And I, when I talk about tip surgery complications, we can have deviations, you can have asymmetry, you can have infections, you can have irregularities, loss of projection or rotation. I'm not here today to talk about all these complications, okay? I'm here today uh, to talk about um, the main complications I'm going to show you based on my own cases. And also I'll show you some little tips and tricks that I use to try to avoid or to try to treat these kind of complications, okay? And let's study from our clinical cases. And first of all, I would say that uh, all of us rhinoplasty lovers and rhinoplasty surgeons, I'm sure somehow in different proportions, we have these beginner's mindset. Because when we have the beginner's mindset, we're moved based on curiosity and we keep our mind open for new, new things. If you didn't have beginner's mindset, you wouldn't be here today. You're only here today because you uh, want to keep evolving, keep growing, and you keep your mind open for new information. And that's the secret for us to keep growing and keep evolving, okay? If you already know everything, you don't need any more uh, new information and you're all good, okay? So this is not a beginner's mindset. So learning from my own mistakes, and as I said here, I'm, I'm going to show some of my own cases. This lady um, looked for me uh, some years ago when I was starting dorsal preservation in hybrid rhinoplasty. And I was on that phase that we can, we want to apply the new technique in every case. So this is a case that I want to show you on purpose, because if you are a beginner in hybrid rhinoplasty, don't try to push dorsal preservation in all your cases. That's the first message, because I did on this case. And this case, if you notice, this patient has a wide tip, a small nose, S-shaped dorsum, a little deep radix. So it's not a dorsum for preservation. It's a dorsum for reconstruction. It's a dorsum for uh, structural rhinoplasty. Remember, the message is you preserve the dorsum that you think it's beautiful or you preserve a dorsum that you can switch to a more beautiful dorsum and then you can drop it down. So this is not that kind of dorsum. It's already a small nose. If I drop it down, it's going to be even smaller. And maybe I would, won't be able to correct this S-shaped dorsum. So that's what happened. During the surgery, uh, I noticed that she had a cartilage dorsum, and I tried to force some kind of dorsal preservation technique. And on this dorsal preservation, I chose the cartilage dorsal preservation. Then, then what happened is in the operating room was quite good. Okay, tip was improved, dorsum was uh, looking straighter, but we have some uh, edema there. And after that, uh, we could. Uh, evaluating this patient in long term, look that uh, dropping down this dorsum made her dorsum a little bit wider and her tip also not so much definition. But on profile, you can see that uh, it improved a little bit her dorsum, but on the same time, she still had some little hump there. So on this type of gnosis, you don't know exactly if it was a little hump recurrence, or if it was a hump that was not treated. So lessons learned from this uh, uh, case is that you have to select very well and carefully your preservation rhinoplasty patients. In our mentoring, and I, I don't have enough time to talk about this here, but in the mentoring, we're, uh, we have some specific lectures focus on patient selection, on patient selection and an algorithm that you can follow when somebody comes to your office and 
it could be an Asian patient, it could be a Latin nose patient, it could be a European nose patient. So you have to choose different kinds of techniques for each patient. So that's the beauty of rhinoplasty. There is not only one size fits all. And uh, you have to select as well patients who are going to be well with dorsal preservation. It's not for every patient. This is another patient that uh, from uh, my beginning, I was, uh, again, I was trying to um, uh, do dorsal preservation in most of my patients. And the dorsum was, uh, had a quite good indication because she had a V-shaped dorsum, a little high, but look what happened if you don't control uh, the tip. Okay, the tip can also be a little wider as well as the dorsum if you don't control. So I had to reoperate this patient when I opened this nose. The good thing is that once you preserve the dorsum, you have uh, less scar tissue formation. You have more natural anatomy because you didn't open, you didn't cut, you didn't distort the natural anatomy, putting a lot of grafts. Basically, you avoided grafts by preserving the dorsum. So that's a good point, and that's the message of this case. The, some revisions, tip revisions or dorsum revisions, they tend to be easier um, in cases like that, okay? So this is her pre-op, this is her, her post-op, the first surgery, and this is her post-op, my revision. So we have to learn how to control these cartilages when they drop down or or sometimes the patient can have some uh, results that are not um, exactly what they were looking for. So the lesson uh, from these cases is that some dorsal preservation techniques can make your dorsum and sometimes your tip a little wider. So you have to control that, you have to identify that, and it's related to the cartilage, it's related also to the thickness of the skin. And preservation rhinoplasty revisions tend to be easier than those super structured uh, cases with rib grafts. This is another lady. She came to my office. She had um, a big dorsum and a droopy tip. Uh, characteristically, these patients, um, they, they can have short lower lateral cartilage. And sometimes, uh, these cause the under rotation and also the cartilages sometimes are very weak on the middle crura. So at the end of the surgery, everything looked fine. And I did a dorsal preservation on this patient. I could treat the S-shaped hump. I could project the tip. and But she came some uh, almost one year after the surgery on the front view was quite good. But on the side view, you can notice that on the supertip break, there is not exactly a break, but there is a little depression on that area. So in my analysis, I didn't have on this case exactly a hump recurrence, but instead I had a little depression on the dorsal cartilage. When I was palpating this patient, the radix was good, the, cartil the, the bony dorsum was good, but the cartilage, was a little depressed. Uh, so two things maybe uh, could have happened to this patient in my surgery. One, uh, sometimes we are more brave to remove the strip under the cartilage because we're seeing it's closer and we're more comfortable. And sometimes we're afraid of touching the perpendicular plate under the dorsum that is going down. So. If you remove more cartilage and don't remove the same amount of bone, sometimes your bone can go down and uh, the cartilage go down a little bit more. And also, if you put a very tight suture anchoring the septum to the dorsum, that dorsal suture to uh, bring this dorsum down and avoid recurrence, so be careful because if you tight too much this suture, you can have a little depression on the cartilage, okay? Especially if you treat 
some patients with weak cartilage, just like we do here in Latin America. So be careful of that. Uh, lessons uh, learned from this case is that dorsal preservation patients, they can have irregularities, okay? Because of the strip that you removed, if you're doing high strip, or some dorsal sutures as well, if it's too tight. So be careful, don't tie too much. Tie the knot only what is sufficient because otherwise you can have some little irregularities in patients. They are so demanding nowadays. They are so, uh, uh, they are having very high expectations, basically because of social media, and um, FaceTime and Zoom, whatever. And we have to uh, follow this. So we have to also improve as surgeons and try to give them the best results as possible. This is another patient, very thin skin. You see the axis of the, uh, the nose is not on the center position. It seems that it's a little crooked to the right and she has a thin skin. So what we did on this patient was also a dorsal preservation and also um, the tip plasty, which is the hybrid approach that we are talking about. At the end of the surgery, I was very happy with the result. The dorsal was good tip was a little bit more rotated, more defined. And <clears throat> these patients with uh, thin skin, they um, uh, we have to be very careful, okay, because uh, they can have more chances of irregularities. So this S-shaped dorsum, it's difficult to use impaction techniques. I'm going to explain very well these impaction or surface techniques in other uh, lectures, but basically impaction techniques means that you impact the bony part and also the cartilage part. The partial uh, or the surface techniques, you can impact the cartilage, but the bones tend to be treated in a conventional way, which is a conventional way. You rasp the bony cap or you only drop down the bony cap but the lateral fractures are not impacted. The lateral fractures are made and performed exactly like we learned, which is the lateral fracture that you can make it with osteotome or with um, uh, piezo if you have it. So you can see on the helicopter view an improvement of the central key area, the dorsal static lines is better. But after the surgery, she had an infection. Uh, when she had an infection, she sent me these pictures and, and immediately I asked her to go to the office and we started the antibiotic creams associated with antibiotic uh, orally and also hyperbaric treatment. And we put some catheters. Uh, these catheters, we use it to um, irrigate tip of the nose because with uh, uh, these, we can irrigate the tip of the nose with uh, antibiotic solution, basically ciprofloxacin. And uh, after some weeks, some, some days, it was uh, starting to improve. And this is her uh, after one year. Okay, so she came back recently. Honestly, I thought that her tip would be even lower. But after this infection that she had, on the area of the tip and also on the super tip, you can see that, uh, especially on the thin skin patient, uh, when you have that, you have an inflammatory process. And the inflammatory process can lead to some cartilage resorption and some cartilage distortion. And this is what happened to this patient on the super tip area. And also showing up uh, a little bit of her uh, irregularity on the dorsum. And these cases, uh, we have to discuss with the patient because it was caused basically by the infection, but we have to keep on their side and maybe evaluate if it's worth it to do uh, some uh, refinements there and maybe use costal cartilage to restructure this, uh, this nose. Okay, so infection can be a problem uh, in our routine. In those infections, what we use, we, we, we tend to do is we collect material for lab examination as soon as possible. 
we start with ciprofloxacin and clean the mycin. Of course, it can change and it can be different depending on the area you live, depending on the hospital you operate. And then uh, we try to do irrigation with antibiotic solution. Okay, it uh, it's a mix of saline solution with um, uh, antibiotic solution. And we use antibiotic cream as well every three hours in hyperbaric treatment. This way you can deal with most of your infections. They're gonna be solved. Okay. Sometimes it can be it can take some time, but <clears throat> it can be solved. This is uh another patient. This patient had uh this type of nose. He brought me something that uh, uh he had on his file that was his nose previously. And also his nose after uh, hyaluronic acid injected in another service, okay? So he came like that and he said, okay, I like it, this result. I, would, I wish I could have a similar result um, maybe with surgery. And when we dissected his tip, there was damage to the cartilage. Don't know exactly how... Uh, uh, that could happen, but you see on the uh, line of the fracture of the cartilage, there is fibrosis. So it was, was something that was there for some months. I don't know if uh, while he used uh, he, he did the, the cosmetic procedure, maybe if somebody tried to put a wire or something like that. Well, at the end of the surgery, we could achieve a most, uh, a very uh, beautiful dorsum a good transition between the dorsum and tip and a better tip position as well. After some uh, weeks, and uh, he, this patient called me and texted me and he started sending me pictures like that. So when he did that, I immediately thought that it was infection. And I asked him to go to the office. He was in another city and I was kind of concerned and uh, about his situation. I gave... Uh, him antibiotic he started using and uh, different from normal infections he started using antibiotics and nothing happened there was no improvement so he sent a picture later on the right and no improvement as well just a little improvement and after that I asked it to do ultras ultrasound of the tissue and the ultrasound of the tissue uh, was able to find hyaluronic acid on the wall of the nose. So this hyaluronic acid was causing the inflammatory process, it was not exactly an infection, but an inflammatory process in his nose. And was exactly the clinic, clinically, it was exactly like an infection, but um, was not responding to antibiotics in the normal treatment of uh, an infection. So then after the diagnose of the inflammatory process caused by hyaluronic acid, then we started with some uh, treatment for that, like steroids. And he started using steroids and everything disappeared. So the message is nowadays, there are a lot of patients doing uh, cosmetic procedures in the nose, okay? Hyaluronic acid, sometimes threads, sometimes um, things that we don't understand and we don't know, and that can be a problem, okay? Uh, be aware of that because maybe you're gonna think that your patient has a big infection and in fact, he has only uh, some um, inflammatory process. So then I had to revise this patient. We used costal cartilage, rib cartilage, and now uh, he's happy. So be careful with patients with hyaluronic acid injection and make pre-op dermatologic ultrasound, both for study and also for legal purpose when you have patients with this history or if you palpate and you think it is there because there is not only hyaluronic acid in the market. Some people are injecting other products and you have to uh, know if it's more um, um, reshapeable like hyaluronic acid that you can aspirate or remove or if it's something more solid or something that 
uh, can cause some distortions in the nose that you are about to operate. So let me show this patient here. She had a, a hump and on the CT scan, uh, we could see that it was not uh, that bad, but she had a uh, little, you can notice that on the radix position, the skin is thicker. And on the uh, key area, the skin is thinner and then it start being thicker again. So that's why when you treat the bony cap or when you do structural rhinoplasty and remove that, uh, that tend to be straighter. So on this case, we did a dorsal preservation uh, an impaction technique with high strip using her cartilage septum as a uh, uh, septic extension graft. So nowadays, when I look this picture or look this video, I operated this patient some time ago. I know that I was able to treat her dorsal. I know that I could improve her dorsal. But on the same time, when I see this picture or in some groups, when I see final results like this, this little hump that you already seen here in the operating room, that will turn in a revision, okay? Because you have to end your surgery and finish your surgery without this. You have to finish your surgery without any spring effect of the dorsum, without um, uh, any uh, blocking point. You have to treat and your dorsum should go down and should uh, go to the correct position with not so big efforts after you release all the structures. So this is her after the surgery. Uh, her dorsum was improved. Her tip was much better. But as we said, uh, this patient uh, was very uh, perfectionist and she wanted a nose straighter and with a little bit projected tip and rotated tip. She wanted to have like a more, she told me, I want to have a little bit more artificial nose. Okay, so um, I had to reoperate this patient and do uh, more grafts to structure this tip and to structure uh, this nose. And now um, she's happy, but I had to do costal cartilage on her. So let's go through some important tips after I show these, uh, my own complications, okay? So the anatomy applied for preservation, and this is the first lecture of uh, our mentoring program, the HRAM, the Hybrid Rhinoplast Advanced Mentoring. We start with basic topics, of course. And one of the basic topics is uh, the anatomy applied to surgery which is different from studying only the anatomy of the nose. We have to study the anatomy applied to dorsal preservation or for the rhinoplasty. And talking about that, we have this relationship between the bony part and the cartilage part. We have to keep in our mind and keep in uh, uh, as a, a huge information that the cartilage goes under the bony part and the cartilage uh, is lied under the bony part on the center part which is written dka is the central part of the k area so it tends to go inside almost one centimeter the lateral part the lka the lateral keystone area it's not so big maybe less than a half centimeter. So the LKA is the lateral key area, is a very important area because in a lot of uh, techniques of dorsal preservation, we have to release the lateral key area. And you guys asked a lot in the groups, what was the ballerina maneuver? The ballerina maneuver I'm going to show here should uh, release the lateral key area, but... Uh, then comes the next question. That won't cause any problem. No, that won't cause any problem if you preserve the central key area or if you preserve the lateral part. So that's why nowadays there are so many different kinds of dorsal preservation. Each technique is best or better for different kinds of noses. So you have to understand that. You have to know 
when to apply the best technique. Well, the bone reshaping is something that every surgeon should have as a concept and as uh, an arsenal. It's something simple, but we didn't learn that. That's the truth, okay? Most of you here are in between 30 years old and 45 years old. I know there are different ages here. I'm just saying it's statistically, okay? There are more senior and more experienced surgeons uh, older than that. And I really uh, grateful that you're here today. But most of the surgeons here, you are around uh, 35 to 45 or 50 years old. And if you are here, maybe you didn't learn during your training how to reshape the bones, only fracturing. And I learned this way as well. So you can fracture, you can do osteotomies, you can use your chisel, you can use your osteotome, you can use piezo if you want, but reshaping the bone is a sculpture. So it's part of the treatment, the correct treatment of the, the nose to sculpt the bone. The bone is never totally symmetric. So why not turning it into a more symmetric bony part before uh, fracturing or before doing the osteotomies, okay? Uh, you can do this with rasps, you can do with sculpting materials, you can do this with piezo, it's up to you. So this is another patient. Uh, I operated him uh, in 2018 when I was starting preservation. I did a high strip and impaction technique. And here, what I want to call your attention is not only the little hump recurrence on the dorsum, but also I remove it too much on the vasa segment. What is vasa segment? W is uh, the connection between the upper lateral cartilage with the septum. So the upper lateral cartilage, the septum is on the midline, the upper lateral cartilage comes from both sides and then forms the shape of a W. This W uh, from this point until the, uh, the anterior septal angle. So you have a little distance. That distance is called vasa segment. The, the segment that goes from the W point until the anterior septal angle. This part is so important when you're doing impaction or surface techniques, because if you remove everything, especially surgeons from Latin America, Central America, Brazil, if you're operating latinosis and you're trying to drop it down and you don't care or you don't pay attention on the vasa segment, you will have depression on the super tip. You will have super tip deformity. You can be sure about that because I already had, this is one of those cases. Okay, I removed too much on the vasa segment. Then I had a hump recurrence in a deep super tip area. So this patient should be, uh, we should have uh, um, a revision to correct that. And here I'm going to show something also some patients, they have a curved dorsum. The perfect case would be a straight dorsum. But some patients, they have a curved dorsum. This curved dorsum, you have to remove a strip. But also, you can come with your scissors. I use curved scissors and break the memory of the cartilage. Why? Because even though you go and cut very close to your dorsum, your scissor doesn't reach the height sufficient to remove everything. And then you have a little strip left there that can uh, maintain the memory of the curvature or the convexity of your dorsum. This is a video to show inside, okay? On this video, you can uh, go there. You see, there is a little strip of cartridge, just like I showed on the uh, drawing. Uh, before and you come with scissor and you can break the memory doing some uh, vertical cuts and trimming under the key area and well the ballerina maneuver or the releasing of the lateral keystone area is something important because pay attention that 
uh, let's suppose that you preserve the centric area, the light blue part connection with the bony part on this drawing. If you have a preservation, uh, uh, this center part preserved, the lateral part, uh, if you release the lateral part as a value in the maneuver, you help this articulation, the connection between, remember I showed previously the anatomy. On the anatomy, this light blue cartilage on the center part goes almost one centimeter under the bone. So there you can have an articulation. You can have a hinge effect on this area. And the, in order to have a better hinge effect, you have to release the lateral part. The lateral part is uh, not an obligation, but most of the times you do that when you want a thinner nose or when you want to articulate better the, uh, the dorsal hump from a curved to a more uh, straight, to a straighter. This is in vivo, okay, in a patient, in a close approach. There is the bone and there is the cartilage. You go in between both and I put my, my dissector on the direction of this, the, uh, the bone, okay? So from inside out, I, I put my strength forcing uh, my dissector against the bone, okay? Another tip and trick that is very important to avoid some complications is to understand the relationship between these structures inside. When you look that, you know that you have the perpendicular plate, you have the septal cartilage, and the connection in between them. Well, the point is how far is the perpendicular plate. Sometimes the perpendicular plate is very back on the back part. Sometimes it's very forward and you have to understand and analyze that. If you have a CT scan, the sagittal cut or uh, some panoramic uh, uh, images is very uh, nice because you know how much of septum or how far you can go with your strip to uh, drop down your dorsum. On this case, for example, the letter C, the letter C is uh, the area that I would like to have uh, close to the letter C is the area where I would do my hinge effect of the bone. I would try to fracture that part partially to drop down, maintaining the height of the radix, but that should go down. And you notice that under the letter C, there is a connection between the perpendicular plate and the septum cartilage, so no need to remove bone. If I analyze in this patient before, during the surgery, I know that I only have to go with my scissor, remove the strip, and that's sufficient. I don't have to lose my time trying to remove some bony part. To remove bony part, if you have to remove the perpendicular plate, use proper instruments. What are the proper instruments? You have to use dissectors, good dissectors. You have to use uh, baby rungers, especially from uh, good brands. Otherwise, they don't cut or they break. And you can have good retractors and also scissors, <clears throat> double, double action scissors. They are the best for uh, septum, okay? Uh, this is Kaplan scissor. And if you want to cut the perpendicular plane, you can cut with the scissor. Don't use or don't uh, risk uh, using um, uh, osteotomes or twisting the perpendicular plate or uh, doing more aggressive uh, things there, okay? Well, let's talk a little bit about the tip. And uh, on the tip, you have to um, focus on stabilizing the tip. How many of you here learn how to do tip plastic only with a floating strut? I learned that, okay? I don't think it's bad. And I'm not criticizing. I think it's very good for some patients. As we said at the beginning, there is no one size fits all. Maybe 
the floating strut is amazing for a uh, Caucasian nose, but I'm sure the floating strut is not sufficient for me, for example. I have thick skin with cartilage short septum. So on these cases, we have to use extension grafts. Extension grafts, they extend your septum cartilage. They extend your cartilage. And why not using the extension both for support and also for uh, uh, design. So this patient here on the video, I created a, um, a septic extension graph end to end that will fit exactly on the caudal septum or uh, also on the vasa segment and will be stabilized by two small spreaders. And this way, you can have a perfect connection there. This is just the start of what we call the puzzle technique. So you can see a little tooth there that uh, uh, fits exactly the caudal septum. And that serves as a connection, that serves as a shape, and that serves also as a support. How we like to do that? You can do that on close approach or on open approach, okay? You can do whatever you want. Uh, on the journey, you saw the close approach, but just to show something different because you can do uh, this open approach. I also do sometimes. And uh, with the forceps on the hand of, on the face of the patient, uh, you mark the rotation and the projection that you need. Okay, if you learn that, you can apply it tomorrow because it's so easy. Then you uncover the, the tip and keep your right hand is st stable there. Don't move it. That's why you, you uh, put your hand on the face of the patient. And then you come with a sterile paper. This sterile paper is nothing uh, special. I just remove it uh, from the suture pack. And uh, we mark a position of the paper in contact with the caudal septum. And then uh, that tend to mark with blood. And then my assistant marked the tip position, the tip position of the dome. From the dome position, you can design the infratip lobule, the infratip break. I, dry, I like to design and draw the contact with the septum. And then the super tip, the super tip area. The super tip area, uh, you can uh, design also if you want more curved, more projected, it's up to you. And after you do that, you can create uh, the shape of the septic extension graph that you design, okay? Once you have that draw, you see the bloody part shows the contact with this step. And then after removing the, rib, the piece of cartilage you want, you just copy and paste on that paper. And after you do that, you can, uh, <clears throat> you can uh, have a perfect shape of your septic extension graft. You can have a perfect shape of your cartilage. And then you can start fixing uh, these on the caudal septum. Okay? When you fix that on the caudal septum, uh, you create the support you need for those Asian noses, Latin noses, and, and remember it can be end to end, it can be side to side. What is important is to stabilize those noses. Otherwise these patients will come back to you complaining about um, uh, uh, tip loss of projection or rotation because they don't have support. They don't have enough support. You have to create it. So in conclusion, uh, in our, uh, for Face Academy, we have now more than a thousand members that uh, help us to grow in the field of rhinoplasty. And also with our experience, we try to help just like we, we're trying to do here today with this lecture, to work as a shortcut for you so you can avoid some complications that I had and also improve yourself as a surgeon. So uh, this is our fourth team, fourth 
group of the HRAM. Some people ask it, what is HRAM? HRAM is hybrid rhinoplasty advanced mentoring. We started that in 2020 and was the first, and it's it's the first online mentoring program about hybrid rhinoplasty in the world. And I'm really proud to say that. This video uh, show how amazing was our journey last week. And I would like to thank you. More than 120 countries participating. I never imagined that. So thank you so much. Each one from Africa, from Asia, from Middle East, from Latin, Latin patients, North America, Mexico. So thank you so much, everybody. Okay. Well, in our mentoring, we focus basically on this uh, on this tripod. The tripod of uh, lectures, but also uh, showing you maneuvers. So the theory part has lectures and also article discussions, but also maneuvers that you can use uh, uh, in your routine. Also edited videos, but the mentoring, okay? You have somebody to ask, you have a group, you have me and I'm here for you guys, okay? I'm here to share my experience, my mistakes, and also my good results because this way we can grow together. So our focus of the HRAM 2.0 is to learn everything we can about hybrid rhinoplasty, which means dorsal preservation mixed with tip structure. Open approach, close approach, doesn't matter. The, these are only ways to do the surgery. Okay, but the fundamentals and the foundation is the same. If you use piezo or not, doesn't matter as well. Okay, you can use your osteotomes um, and you can have great results. You have one year access to this platform that I said. There you can find uh, surgeries. You can find uh, our discussions. Everything we do, we stay recorded and go to the platform. And this year we created something special for you, which is the, uh, uh, you already have some content there, but every lecture we're going to deliver live, every article discussion as well. And then it's going to uh, be a very intense um, uh, period of time. We have seven modules, as you can see on the right, we're going to cover from the basics, then the dorsal preservation, surface techniques, then dorsal preservation, impaction techniques, then tip plastic concepts, puzzle tip plastic, then refinements in rhinoplasty, and then the most common complications in management. So I'm going to detail more this lecture that I gave for you today. So this way, I want to cover all these things about the program of hybrid rhinoplasty. And I hope at the end, you are able to perform that. Ask me anything you want. I'm here for you, okay? I'm here and I really love this. My two passions, professionally speaking, is to uh, operate, of course, my surgeries and also uh, teach. Well, one message for you, we're opening groups. On these groups, two things will happen, okay? You can ask doubts, to my team about the age ram or about anything just like we were we were answering you in the other groups and number two there is an opportunity we're, op we're opening an opportunity for you to give me suggestions of a future lecture we want to hear you we want to listen to you because uh, this way you help us to grow and you help us to produce uh, a design lecture for what you're looking for Remember this message, your last mistake is your best teacher. And as I said previously, we put a lot of effort, energy in our heart in the hybrid rhinoplasty advanced mentoring, okay? Uh, for me, it's so grateful to meet people from all over the world. I don't teach you guys only, I learn a lot from you. And we grow together on the field of rhinoplasty. And I have, uh, I work a lot 
to bring the best experiences possible and the best information as possible for you. And I truly believe that uh, this can help you to um, save time in your career, in your life, okay? So the registrations started this week. It's going to be available only until uh, this Sunday. And uh, if you don't do the registration now, not a problem, but we do that only once a year, okay? And the next uh, group will be only in, in in the next year, probably in May. So thank you so much, each one of you who spent this hour here with me. I hope you enjoyed this uh, information today. And I really hope also to see you on board and to see you inside there. For those who are watching our lives and lectures, we started also with Metaverse and some of our meetings and some of our uh, studies in 3D anatomy will be in the Metaverse. Okay, I'm really excited to see what we're going to do this year on the HRM 2.0. Again, thank you so much. Gracias a todos. Obrigado a todos. Thank you, everybody, for being here to spend a little bit of your time to watch here. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you, you could incorporate some new concepts and see you inside the HRM 2.0. Thank you so much.